Well, first of all, let me say hello, welcome to Thailand and to this discussion about Buddhism. And I'll give a little speech, a little talk, and later on, if you have any questions that you like to ask, you will do that as the next thing. Okay. The first thing is to tell you something about Buddhism. Buddhism, when you when you think of it, when you hear when you when you think that you are studying Buddhism or finding out something about Buddhism, you'll find out that in fact you are really finding out about yourself because Buddhism teaches about ourselves, what we are, who we are. It teaches something that we might not think about before, like we are twins, but we don't know that we are all twins, because we, because we cannot see the other half of ourselves. Our life actually is made up, made up of two parts. The part that we can see is the body. But the other part that we cannot see is the mind. The body is the physical part. Right? The mind is the spiritual or non-physical part. They are two separate entities. They are not together. They only came together at the time of conception. At the time when, when the sperm and the egg form and then the mind, which is like a spirit, come in and take possess possession of that that sperm and egg, that combination of sperm and egg. That's when you have conception. And from that point onward, the body starts to grow until it gets so big that it has to be ejected from the body. That's, what, that's when birth takes place. See, when there is birth, we only look at one half, or we can only see one half of, of ourselves. We can only see our body, but we cannot see our mind. Because our mind or our spirit is like an electronic, electromagnetic force, like, like the radio wave that we use in our cell phone. You can see your phone, but you cannot see the the wave, the the radio wave that come into the cell phone or being transmitted from the cell phone. When you use your cell phone, you call somebody, you punch a number and then send it out. What you send out is the the signal, which is something that you cannot see with your eyes, but you know it is there. So too with our life, we are made up of, we are made up of the mind and the body. The mind is the one that knows, that feels, that thinks. The, bo the body doesn't know, doesn't feel, doesn't think. The body is like a piece of material like the cell phone, it doesn't think. <clears throat> it only do certain function. Like the body breathe, the body maintain itself, its ability to 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 act as a, a medium for the mind. See the body has eyes to see, have ears to listen, for instance. But it's the mind that actually is the one who sees and hears. Without the mind, the body is like a corpse. When, pe when a person dies, it means that the, the mind and the body separated. When, when there is no mind to take possession of this body, 
the body doesn't know anything, doesn't feel anything. You can cut, cut up the body in any way you like. You can burn it, you can bury the body. And the body would not know that it is being cut up, burned or buried. It is the mind who knows this thing. As long as the, the mind is still with the body, when anything happens to the body, it is the mind that reacts, not the body. When we feel bad, when we, when we are afraid that something bad might happen to the body, it is not the body that is feeling bad. It is the mind. Because the mind doesn't know that it isn't the body. The mind, due to delusion, due to the la lack of the proper knowledge that that the mind is not the body, it takes the body as itself. So whenever anything happens to the body, the body, the mind becomes affected adversely. It can feel very bad, sometimes to the point of suffering. This is because no one tells the mind that the body is not itself. So it's only one person in the world, the first person that is able to realize the truth of this is the Buddha. That's when he that's what he called enlightenment, to be able to perceive the nature of the mind, to know that it is separate or different from the body. The body and the mind, like I said at the start of the talk, that they are twins. We are twins. We have the mind and we have the body. So the problem is not with the body, because the body doesn't feel or doesn't know anything. It is like a piece of wood here. It, it doesn't feel or know anything. Anything, whatever happens to it, doesn't affect it in any way. We can take this piece of wood, cut it up, burn it, or do anything to it. It doesn't matter. But the person who possess or own this, this piece of wood will be affected. Here I mean the mind, who owns the body, who thinks the body as itself, or uh, its possession. Whatever happened to the body in a negative way, it will feel very uncomfortable, feel very, very miserable. And it's something that the body eventually will have to come to that point one day. Right now, you are young. You are only, your body is only growing. It's in the process of developing. But it will eventually peak, uh, reach the, the, the peak of development, probably around middle age, when you're 40. And after that, the body will start to degenerate. It will be, instead of being stronger, it will become weaker, weaker. It will be affected by all kinds of illness. And it will get older and older. And eventually it will stop functioning, it will die. This is the nature of the body. But the mind who who, who takes this body as itself doesn't have the same characteristic like the body. The body doesn't develop nor does it degenerate. It doesn't get old, it doesn't get sick, or it, it doesn't die. But it has to leave the body when the body no longer can function. That's what we call the separation of mind and body at the time of death. To most people, they think that when the body dies, everything dies with the body. 
but according to the Buddha, it's only the body that dies. The mind who is the master of the body, the, the one who, who possesses the body, who uses the body to do all the things that we do, doesn't die with the body. The mind just go on and look for a new body. This is when we have rebirth. When the mind finds a suitable body, it then takes possession of that body again, that body. And after a certain period of time, it will be born again with that new body. But the body that the mind takes up can be many different types. It could be human beings. It can also be the body of animals. Like the mind might take up the body of a cow, of a chicken, of an elephant, of a fish, whatever. Fish are the animals and humans are the same in this respect. They both have body and mind. Only the intelligence of the mind is different. To be born as a human being, the mind has to have a higher intelligence, has to, has to have the ability to distinguish right from wrong, good from bad. Why? To be born as animal, you don't have to have that distinguish, that, ab that ability to separate good from bad, right from wrong. That's why animal lives different from human beings. Human beings know that in order to live together, we have to respect each other's rights. We cannot hurt other people, for instance. Why animal doesn't have this ability to distinguish? They will do whatever they like. They don't care if they hurt anybody. That's why animal, when they're hungry, they will eat other animal. But with us human, we know that we cannot just go kill somebody for food. So we, we have this ability to distinguish. It means that in our past lives, the mind has developed a certain amount of intelligence, uh, has developed the ability to distinguish right from wrong, good from bad. And if the mind in, in this life keep up learning about this right and wrong, good and bad, and maintain it, then it will preserve its ability or its status as a human being. When it dies and separate from the body, it will have the opportunity to take up an, another human birth in the future. But it does, if it doesn't maintain this, this, this distinguishing of, of good and bad, of right and wrong, like some people who behave like animals. They don't respect the rights of other people. They hurt other people, like killing other people. Then they have degenerated their mental status. Their, their, their intelligence has been demoted or degenerated to the level of an animal. So in their next life, they will more likely to take up the body of an animal than they will take up the body of a human being. So this thing goes on and on from one life to the next. But if we are born as a human being and we are lucky enough to run into a Buddha, uh, to run to, into his teaching, then he will tell us, then we will know by his teaching that we are supposed to develop our mind. This is the only real development, the real 
the, the lasting development, the development of other things like of our body, of all the material things like buildings, highways, all these things are not lasting development because everything in this world is subjected to the law of change, to the law of impermanence. Everything, no matter what that human built, the greatest empire in the history before, they all deteriorate and they all disappear after a certain length of time. Like the Roman Empire, for instance, they lasted for for a length of time and then after that they degenerate and then eventually they disappear from the surface of the earth. So any kind of development that has to do with material things is not lasting. It's like building a sand castle by the beach at low tide. When the tide comes in, it will wash all the castles away. So is the time. Time will wash everything away. This planet is, is not infinite. This planet is, has its own age. And one day this planet will dissolve due to the law of impermanence. But there's one thing that doesn't, isn't subjected by the, this law of impermanence, and that's the mind. The mind isn't subjected by this law. The mind exists forever. The only problem is the way it exists isn't good enough for us because it exists under delusion, under the influence of de delusion, not knowing the truth about itself and about everything else that it has come into possession with. Like it doesn't understand or know the truth of the body. It doesn't understand or know the truth of itself. It doesn't know what makes it happy and what make, what make it sad. It's only the Buddha who have discovered this truth. He knows what makes the mind happy and he knows what makes the mind unhappy. He knows the nature of the body. He knows that the body is not the mind. So this is something that our mind doesn't know. That's why we need somebody like the Buddha to teach us to tell us about this truth. Once we have understood the truth and behave appropriately, then our mind will always be happy. It will never be sad. It will never have to worry. It will never have to be afraid of anything. Like we are all afraid that one day our, something bad will happen to our body or something bad will happen to the body of our loved ones like our father, our mother, our brothers and sisters, our friends. That's because we never thought of the truth of the body that, the, that everybody has to get old, get sick and die eventually. And the time for it to happen varies from person to person. There is no fixed time schedule for each body. Anybody can get old at any time. Anybody can die at any time. The only fixed schedule that you can place on the body is the aging. You know that as, at this age the body will be like this. At the next age it will be like that. This is pretty obvious. But as far as getting sick or getting killed, no one knows when it's gonna happen. So 
the, the, the Buddha realized that this is the cause of, of unhappiness in the mind. And he tried to find out how to make the mind happy even under the, the situation when the body gets sick or dies. And he could only see that only way to do it is to treat the body as somebody else, as not yourself. So he, he realized then that the body is actually not the mind. The mind doesn't have to, the, the mind doesn't have to cling to the body because when the mind clings to the body, it makes the mind unhappy. Like something, like a person that you don't know, you've never met. When you heard that he or she gets sick or die, it doesn't affect your mind at all. But if someone you know, or you have a certain affection or clinging or attachment to that person, when that person gets sick or die, you become the mind your mind become affected. Your mind become depressed, become sad, become worried. So after investigating the cause that makes the mind unhappy, the Buddha realized that it's due to his the mind's de delusion or ignorance of the fact that the body doesn't belong to anybody. The body actually is part of nature, like the trees, like the rain, like the sun, like the sky. It doesn't belong to anybody. But due to the mind's delusion or ignorance, it claims these things to be its possession. Like it claims the body that it takes possession of during the time of, of con conception to be its possession, to be itself. Once it thinks that the body is itself, belong to itself, then when, uh, whenever something bad happens to, to the body, it becomes very unhappy, very, very affected, very depressed for instance. But when you realize or the mind realizes that this body is not yourself and you can let go of it, treat it like the body of somebody else you don't know, then what, whatever happens to it uh, will happen to it will not make the mind unhappy. So this is where the Buddhism teaching comes comes in. It teaches you how to make your mind happy. And in order t for your mind to be happy, your mind has to accept the fact that nothing belongs to the mind. Everything belongs to nature. Like our body, it comes from nature. It comes from the food that we eat. And the food comes from nature comes from the land, comes from the water, comes from the air. They combine and then becomes different kind of food. Like the rice you plant in the field. You need water, you need soil, you need the sun, which is the energy. You need rain, which is the water. When these four elements combine, it makes the rice grow and eventually bear uh, the seed. Then we take this seed up and this grain of rice and cook it and then put it into our body along with other kinds of food. Then it, then it transforms to the different parts of our body. Our body starts to grow, our hair grows longer, our body get bigger, our bone get stronger. This all comes from the food that we eat. 
and the food that we eat all comes from these four elements water, fire, air and and wind yeah I think what I said water, air, fire and and earth yeah. there's four parts this is what makes up this body and when this body stops functioning it goes back to these four elements if you leave it in the if you bury it in the in the ground all the body all the water all the fluid will eventually uh, depart from the body leave the body the heat will leave the body the air will leave the body leaving just the earth part of the body that will eventually become part of the earth so this is something that we have to teach our mind to see clearly that this body is not ourself it's only made up of the four elements and it is not permanent it's not lasting it will last for maybe 80 years or 100 years then eventually it will dissolve if we keep teaching our mind like this then our mind will be equipped be ready to face the reality the truth of the body when it happens then the, then we can live in peace and and feel at ease all the time regardless of what might happen to the body because we already know that this body is not ourself the bo this body is not the mind this body can be anything it will not affect our mind our mind will just feel at ease, comfortable and fearless at all times because it is always ready to let whatever is going to happen to the body happen it doesn't resist the truth of the body when the time for the body to get sick it let it get sick but it doesn't mean that it doesn't do anything if it still can fix the body if it can take it to the hospital to get some medicine or to take some care, some, some care it, it can still do that but it, it knows that eventually one day it will not be able to fix this body see if, if this is something that the mind can learn and teach itself to let go of it then it will never have to worry about this body it will never be afraid of whatever is going to happen to this body but if, that, if it doesn't be taught or told of this truth then it will cling to this body and, whenever, and when what, whenever, whatever happens to the body it will be very it will feel very bad miserable it will be afflicted with anxiety, worry, fear so the, the whole story here is that the Buddha teaches the liberation of the mind from, from all forms of suffering mental suffering, mental pain if anyone who can take up his teaching and apply to his mind he will not be subjected to any mental pain regardless of whatever might happen to anything, to anybody to its own body it will not, that's, it will not affect the mind at all because the mind knows that everything is like that and no one else, no one can prevent it from happening no one can stop this this happening in this world 
everything will go according to whatever caused it to happen. And the way to do this thing, he gave us three, three, three steps of practice. First, we must let go of our possession, of our, of our things that we don't need, things that we have more than we can use. For instance, if you have more money than you can use, then he said you shouldn't keep it. You should give it away, give it to charity, help other people. Because if you cling to that, that money, that money will only cause you a problem, mental problem. You have to worry about keeping it safe, then you will also use it to your detriment. That is, you will use it in the wrong way like spending it on luxury goods or spending it on things that will hurt your body and your mind like alcohol or drugs or entertainment. You might think you, you are enjoying this thing but you, in the long run you, you, you end up being a servant or being an addict to this thing and you would have to have them all the time. Whenever you are not, when you cannot have the things that you used to have, then your mind will become very, very sad, very depressed. So, when you have extra money, don't use them on this thing because it's bad for you. Instead, if you use it by giving it to charity, it will make you feel a lot better. When you have helped someone, you might feel very happy, very, very content. This is the first step that he teaches us, is to practice charity, to live simple, don't have, don't, don't have much possession, just have enough for your existence. You don't need to have a, a palace as a house, you don't need to have the designer clothing for your clothing. You can just live simple, sim simply. Just enough to take care of the body. If you can do this, it will cut down your... Uh, <coughs> cut down the pressure for you to go look for money. Because if you spend a lot of money, then you would have to look for a lot of money to spend. And instead of being happy, you uh, you will be more you will be more unhappy because you will have to work harder, and you will have to have more worry because you don't know if you will be able to find the money that you want or not. But if you live simple, if I use the word cheap, you know, then you won't have to spend so much money. You don't have to spend so much money. Then you won't have to work so hard to find money, to get the money to spend. So this is the first step of, of letting go of your attachment to, to things that you don't really need, things that don't make your mind happy, but make your mind unhappy. So you have to be charitable charitable, you have to get rid of your possession. The second step is to live a, a moral life. Yeah. That is, you should maintain the five precepts, which means, one, abstain from killing other human beings or, or other living beings. Second, abstain from stealing or taking the possession that doesn't belong to you. Three, abstain from sexual misconduct. Here in Buddhism we mean you should only have sex with your married couple, your wife or your husband, and you should be faithful to them. Not have any extramarital activity. 
Thirdly, you should abstain from speaking falsehood. You should only speak the truth. And fifth, you should abstain from taking any substance that will cause your mind to be unstable, unmanageable, like taking alcohol or drugs. Because when you cannot manage your mind or control your mind, then you, you might not be able to keep the, the other four precepts. When you get drunk, you might speak falsehood, you might commit adultery, you might take somebody's profession without their permission, or you might even kill somebody. But if you can maintain your mind, can control your mind, like you are now, then you, it will be more likely that you will be able to maintain the, the, the other four precepts. Because this, if you break these four precepts, it, it can only hurt you later on. Like when you steal somebody's possession, you might be subjected to suspicion, you might be then caught, and you might be punished. So it's better to avoid these activities in order to make your mind live peacefully and happily. And then the third step that the Buddha teaches us to, to develop or to practice is the practice of mental development, which consists of meditation for calm and meditation for insight. Because this is what makes the mind truly happy. When you meditate and you stop your mind from thinking, and when the mind eventually stops thinking for a while, you'll find peace and happiness that you have never found before. Once you have found this happiness, you will realize that no other happiness, no other kind of happiness in this world is comparable to this kind of happiness. And then it will make you want to have more of this kind of happiness. You will then spend more time doing meditation. But this kind of happiness only happens during when you meditate, when your mind stops thinking. But after it comes out of this, this state of of calm, of peacefulness, and when it starts to think, if it doesn't have the proper knowledge, it will start to think about possessing or acquiring things again. It will still think that the, this body belongs to itself. It still wants to have this and that for the body. So you have to teach the mind that this body is not permanent. This body will eventually die one day. This body doesn't belong to yourself. It is not you. The mind is not the body. In order to be able to let go of its attachment or clinging to this body or to any other thing, any other body, attachment to other person, attachment to other property or possession. If you have any clinging or attachment to them, if it, it can only cause your mind to be, to be miserable, to be depressed, to be painful. This is what we call the contemplation or the meditation for insight. Insight means to, to be able to grasp or to know the nature of things that, you, that your mind come into contact with, that they are all impermanent, that they don't belong to you, that they will not be able to give you true happiness. This is what we have to constantly teach the mind. Because once we can do this, then the mind will eventually let go of all its attachment. When it, when it can let go, then it will always live in peace and happiness. It will not be 
afflicted with any kind of worries or anxiety or fear or depression or misery because it doesn't care whatever happens. It can it know it doesn't it doesn't happen to the mind. It only happens to the things that the mind attached to. But once the mind let go of the of that attachment to those things, then look, then whatever happened to those things will not affect the mind. This is what we call freedom from suffering, freedom from mental pain. And this is the goal of Buddhist practice, to, to teach the mind to know the truth of itself, of the mind itself and of everything else that the mind come into contact with. That the mind has to let go of everything. Don't cling to anything. Because it cannot. One day, when, when this body stops functioning, it will just leave this world, leave this country and go for a new world, for a new body and start all over again. And this been, this has been like this for, for countless of lives. The life that we have taken and lost has been more than we could account for. And it will still be like this for forever and ever. If we don't take up the teaching of the Buddha and teach the mind this truth, once you have taught the mind this truth, then the mind will let go of, it, of everything. It, then it will not go take up a new form of body, a new body. There it will be no more rebirth for the mind. Because the mind doesn't need anybody to exist happily. Like the mind of the Buddha. After his body breaks down, he, his mind doesn't go seek for a new body anymore. Because his mind has full contentment, has maximum happiness, so it doesn't need to have anything to make it happy anymore. Not like our mind. Our mind still need this and that to make it happy. That's why we go go seek for things. That's why we go to school. Because we, going to school means it will give us the the opportunity to work to get more money. If we don't go to school, then our ability to to work for more money would not be as good as someone who goes to school. So, so it all boils down to our desire, and our desire is being caused by our delusion. We don't know that what we, whatever we look for or see, they are not, they cannot give you real happiness. And besides not giving you real happiness, they also give you problems. They give you mental pain. Because whenever, whatever you have, you will become possessive and you will be worried or afraid to lose them. But you don't know if you can can keep them for as long as you like or not. Because someday somebody might steal it from you. And when that happens, you will feel very bad. So to recap the whole thing here is that the teaching of the Buddha teach us about ourselves, that we are twins, we are mind and body. And the most important thing between these two is the mind, not the body. The mind is lasting, why the body is not lasting. So we should not spend too much time worrying or taking care of the body, but we should spend all, most of our time taking care of our mind by follow, following the three steps of practice that the Buddha teaches us to do.
that is to be to practice charity, to practice morality, maintain the five precepts, and to practice meditation. If we can do this, one day we will come to to accomplishment or of our of our goal, that is to live happily forever. Like in the movie, when they, the mo- the story and they usually say they both live happily ever after. And this is what we will get from following the teaching of the Buddha. So I think this is what I have to to say to you. If you have anything else you you think you want to ask me, you're welcome to. Um, after after one um, after one moves from life to life after rebirth, we said there comes a time when your mind is totally happy and you don't need the rebirth anymore. Mm. What happens? What happens then? Where is forever? The mind. See, the mind can exist with a body or without a body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the mind doesn't disappear from from anything, you know. but it's just not in the three-dimensional world that we exist in. It is in a separate sphere of existence. It is always there. Right now, we, we have the mind with us, but we don't know it. We think, we think our body thinks and feels, but actually it's not this body that thinks and feels. That is the mind. See? And if the mind is fully happy and content, then when this body stops functioning, this stop, then the mind doesn't have to go look for a new body. That's all. This is what the Buddha called Nirvana, Nibbana. It's a state of mind where the mind doesn't have to seek for a new body, for a new form of existence because all forms of existence are under the law of change, under the law of impermanence. And when, when, when the, the mind has to go through this, it, it will then be afflicted with, with mental pain, because when it, when it takes up a body, it naturally becomes attached to that body. And when it loses that body, it will then become very painful for it. So when it doesn't take up a new body, that means it doesn't have to take up any more pain. Understand? Okay. Yeah? Um, some people are treated um, fundamentally um, um, unfair, maybe by the government, um, like it is the case maybe in Tibet. Uh, do you think um, a strictly peaceful approach by um, relying on your next life is the right way to cope with such a situation? No, the, the, the right way to cope with the situation is to, to, to do like the Buddha did. It's not to take a new life, just as I explained to you. Because when you're born, no, regardless of whatever society you are born in, you are born in the society where there are always this greed, hate and delusion in the mind of each individual. And this greed, hate, and delusion in the mind of those individuals will be the cause of conflict, the cause of of uh, of a problem. Yeah. If everyone can live and not bother other people, then it will be all right. See, but no one likes to do that. Everybody likes to 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 hurt or to to subject other people and under their, their power, for instance. That's because the mind has not been taught properly to live properly. The mind still under the delusion to think that to be able to acquire things or people under the subject, under the command, makes them feel better, makes them feel good. So this kind of thinking will only cause uh, struggle, war in the society.
the only way to do this is, this is a personal salvation it's not uh, a mutual or uh, a salvation for everyone this is something that we all have to seek for ourselves because everyone has different way of looking at things and we cannot convince everyone to think the same way that we think the Buddha never tried to teach everyone to become like him he only taught to those people who like to think like him and this this kind of problem exists not just in this time of not in our time it exists like this in the past if you study history you know that there are always problems there's always war it will always be like that because the mind of each individual hasn't yet been taught the right knowledge okay. did Buddha uh, reach to the stage of enlightenment within one human life? No, this the last human life was one was one of the long series of life in which he developed his mind and he said it's countless many many lives before he eventually reached the pinnacle of his development where he was able to penetrate the truth of the mind no one knows that there is the mind everything say mind mind but we don't know what it is actually all the scientists think that the mind is part of the body when the body dies then the mind also disappear with the body but this is not so and you will experience it in your meditation when you when your mind becomes very calm very quiet sometimes it seems like it, it it is detached from the body the body would disappear from its consciousness from its awareness then you know that there is this mind that is not part of the body Okay. You say the mind is reborn, but how come that we still have to learn everything over when we're born? We don't learn. We we don't learn everything over again. It's only the place, the 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 knowledge that we haven't been taught of. Like when you're born in a into a different nationality, you have to relearn the language, for instance. But what you don't learn is your like or dislike. You have it still with the mind. If you like cigarettes, you like alcohol, you don't have to be taught this. When you come across alcohol or cigarette, you will know that you like it right away. But if you don't if you don't like alcohol or cigarette, when you come across it, you don't like it. Same thing with other things, cut like colors. When you see some colors, you like them, and see some other colors, you don't like them. This is not something that you you learn from your parents. You don't get it this from your parents. Your parents might like colors that you don't like. That's because your like, your like and dislike doesn't come from the body. Your like and dislike come from the mind, which come from a previous life. So previously, whatever you have, develop it will come with you if you like to be if you like being a good person like you will keep on that liking if you like to be a bad person you will keep that also so when people come and and born even in the same family your brother your brother or sister might not have the same kind of liking or, di or dislike this is because this is something that you take it with you from your previous life. See? See? But when you learn about Buddhism in one life, then you will still not know it in the other life. Maybe the name of Buddhism that you might not know because the language changed from one culture, from one nationality to the next but the essence of Buddhism remains like the practice of charity remains 
the practice of morality remain, the practice of meditation remain in your mind. You, you have developed these three stages. When you take up the next life, you just continue on with this practice. That's why some people can, can, can practice meditation easily, why some other people, person cannot practice easily. Some people can give to charity easily, or some people can maintain the precept easily. Why others cannot do it? It's because of what you have done in your previous life. Okay? But you will, you, you will probably forget who you were, what you were in your previous life, unless if you practice your meditation to a point where it might be able to recollect past life then you will then remember what you were in your past life, whether you were a Dane or you were a Czech, a Chinese, or you were a cow or a chicken, you will be able to, to rec recollect past life. This is possible when you practice meditation. Okay? in their life never really discovered Buddhism or looked further into it and still did things that were not okay with, in the Buddhist kind of way. Would he ever find uh, nirvana or would it just go on being uh, reborn to eternity? Yes, because if he still seek for the truth, there's only one truth. And when he found that, he, he would become a Buddha himself. So. Like the Buddha, he, he sought for this truth and no, no religion or no teacher could teach him this, tell him about this truth. So he had to find it out for himself. And this truth is the truth of the mind, the nature of the mind, and the nature of everything. That the mind thing is, has a personality, has, a, has an eye. But in fact, everything doesn't have an eye, doesn't have a personality. This is a, the truth that will, will set the mind free from all kinds of suffering. So if you cannot, for instance, uh, develop to your knowledge that you have learned from Buddhism, and maybe your next future, your, your next few lives, you might have lost or forgotten this truth that you have heard because you haven't yet it haven't yet sunk into your mind deep enough to re, to remain there. Then you will have to find the truth yourself. Or perhaps you might run into a future Buddha. Because there's not only one Buddha. There are many Buddhas throughout all the ages. They are this these are people who seek for the truth. And when they have found the truth then they teach it to other people. We call these people Buddha. The one who knows. It means the one who knows the truth. So there will be more Buddhas coming in the future. And who knows, maybe one of you might be one of them. If you cannot benefit from the teaching of the other Buddhas, then you might eventually have to find the truth yourself. But it might be a long time before you ever get to that truth. Because if it's hard enough to to learn the truth from someone else who already know, how hard would it be to find to seek for the truth yourself? It is like if you have someone tell you the direction to get to where you want to go and you still couldn't go there. And what about you have to find the direction yourself? How hard it will it be? So it's always considered to be fortunate or lucky to be to come across the teaching of a Buddha because it saved us a lot of trial and errors. We have a map, we have a direction. All we have to do is follow it. And this map or direction is just as I mentioned, these three steps of practice, charity, morality and meditation. Next My question. second question would be, uh, does Buddhism differentiate between women and men? 
the Maya doesn't differentiate. The Maya is all the same. All the Maya of, of women or men are the same. But the liking or disliking of the Maya, that, that makes it a woman or a man. So Maya likes to act like a woman, so it becomes a woman. The mind likes to act like a man, it becomes a man. Okay. Okay. And in the... I mean, normally when people are born, they belong to a family. And uh, yeah, that's just the, the physical part. Uh, is, is it the same? Is, is there such hier- hi- hierarchy in the mental, in the, in the, in terms of the soul of the person? Mm-hmm. Is there like a family structure when you were reborn, do you belong to the same family and all your relatives when they are reborn in another, in another body, do they still belong to the same family or it could be? Not necessarily. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It has so many different factors involved. One of the factors is if you feel very close to your your past family and they felt very close to you and you did something similar in your past life together, it might be the factor that will cause you to come together again in your future life. Okay. <coughs> Nearly every human being uh, is trying to, sa- to satisfy him or herself uh, by, uh, by satisfying this I. Mm-hmm. I want to get rich, I want to study, even if you do something good, I, I, do, I want to do charity to feel better. Uh, how, what do you think, to which extent does this I interrupt you to get free, uh, true freedom? The freedom is the... It's the main obstacle to freedom. It is something that you have to discover in your meditation. Because when you meditate until the mind stops thinking, then you, then you feel the disappearance of the eye. Then you realize that the eye is only a concoction of the mind. The mind thinks, like there's a saying, I think I am, therefore I am. If you don't think you are, then there won't be you. But you never stop thinking. You always think, I am, I am, me, 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 all the time. But when you stop, when you meditate to the point where the mind fully stops thinking, even for a brief moment, then you feel there's a different kind of person in yourself. There's, there is this person without an eye, and you feel so much at ease and comfortable then you realize that this is probably your true, your true self. The self without an eye <laughs> is kind of contradictory because our language always based on the eye. But really the mind is just a, an awareness. Someone, a person, not a person, uh, a knowing, a consciousness. But it is under the illusion to, to think that it itself is an eye. It itself is a person. Um, I have a question. I mean, when, when I don't want to be like, uh, I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to start everything with an eye. How can I still be part of the community that I'm living in? Don't I have to be then kind of secluded to be in that space? Well, your activity should be selfless. You should do things for other people, not for yourself. Yeah, so I should be around with people. Yeah, you can be around with people, and but you don't do it for yourself. Don't use your eye as the basis. Whatever you do, you only do for your body. Like you eat for your body, not for your mind. If you eat for your body, you don't have to choose the kind of food to eat because the body can eat any kind of food. That's how monks are, are taught to live. We're supposed to live. When we feed the body, we're not supposed to feed. We're only supposed to feed for the body, not for the mind. We should forget what we like. If we like to eat this particular kind of food, we should resist from eating it. Because if you if you eat something you like, that means you're eating for for the eye, for the de- for the delusion. So. so we're supposed to eat like we eat medicine, like we take medicine. 
It doesn't have to be the kind of food that we enjoy. We can eat anything as long as it keeps the body healthy and maintain it. So you can live in a society and instead of uh, working for yourself, like giving a lot of money, for instance, you just say, oh, I just want enough money for, for the body, to maintain the body, and the rest of the money I'll give it back to the, to the society for, for helping other people. This is one way of destroying the, the I in yourself. That's why what, that's what the Buddha teaches us to practice charity. Okay. Do you think it's possible to get rid of the I? Yes, the Buddha did. And there are many other people who follow his teaching and did. Because the I is only in your thoughts, see. But it's so strong that you cannot stop it. It becomes so strong that it becomes part of your existence. And to to kick the eye out of your existence is very difficult. Like when you're standing in a queue, for instance, and someone cut in, for instance. If you, there's no eye, then just stand there and let them cut in, you know. No reaction whatsoever. But no, your, your eyes say, no, this is wrong. You, know, you start saying, hey, you cannot do this, you know, so forth. Yeah. Why are there no female monks? Because living as a monk is a very harsh condition, very dangerous, because monks are supposed to live in the forest, because we need the quiet of the forest to develop meditation. And we need to live in simplicity. We have to cut off everything that the mind is attached to, because they are hindrance to our, our development. And for women to live like men, like monks, male, male monks, is very dangerous sometimes. And it's very hard for them to do. There are some female practitioners, but, but according to the Buddha, the tradition of ordaining female has, has been disrupted, has been, has been severed. So we cannot ordain or then female monks anymore. But doesn't, that doesn't stop the female from practicing just like the male monks. They can do it, but without the, the uniform, that's all. They can still practice the three stages of development just like the monks do. But they have to do it on their own. They cannot live in a community like a monk, monk's community. Who is going to teach them? The monks, the, whoever know, whoever have this knowledge of the Buddha's teaching, will be their teacher. Indirectly. The, directly or indirectly, for instance, I have many female, female Buddhists who come and ask for my advice. Okay. Then they go back to their houses, they practice in their house, in their homes, and then they run it. And occasionally they will go to a, a forest monastery where they have. Uh, places where women can stay and practice. It's safer to, to be in a monastery for women. It's very dangerous for them to be living in, in the wild forest by themselves. But this is what they did during the time of the Buddha. Most monks live in the wild by, alone by themselves because they want to eject this eye from this body. When you live in a, a very dangerous place, in order to live in peace, you would have to eject this body from the mind. The, the mind must relinquish this body, must not consider this body as itself. See? Because if it cannot do this, it will not be able to stay for long. Because as soon as you, you, you come close to any form of danger, you will feel <laughs> like you want to go to a safer place. How does the life of the monk uh, really look like? How do you practice morality, charity? Well, charity, we have to give up our possession when we become a monk. We, have, we cannot take anything with us. And all we have now is eight, eight articles or eight objects of, that is necessary for our existence. One is the bowl, the baking bowl. 
we use this to go out in the morning to collect food. Then we have three pieces of rope as our garment, as our clothing. This makes four. Then we have a belt. This is five. Then we have a, a razor to shave our head with. This is six. Then we have a water strainer. This is used because when we live in the forest, we have to get water from our from a stream, for instance, which might have some mosquitoes or some 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 animals in the water. So we used to we have to use a strainer to separate these things. We don't want to have them in our drinking water. And the last thing is we have to have a a needle and and thread to fix our rope with. These are the eight articles or eight objects that the Buddha allowed the monks to have as a possession. Other than that, we should not have anything. This is charity. You give up everything, give up your money, give up your family, give up your friends, give up everything. And then you maintain the second stage. The monk has 227 precepts or rules that he has to follow. They are more like uh, regulations, how to behave properly, how to eat, how to walk, how to stand. Like monks cannot stand and piss, for instance. We have to sit down. <laughs> it, uh, for some reason in ancient India it's considered rude for, to stand and piss. When we eat, we're supposed to sit and eat. We cannot walk and eat at the same time or stand and eat, for instance. And everything that we eat has to be presented, has to be offered, has to be given by hand to us. We cannot just take anything and eat it. So these are regulations to maintain the, the status of, uh, of a monk, to make people feel respectful of the monk, make, make the monk respected, because they have a higher standard of, of behavior, of conduct. This is the, the chair, this is the moral morality part. Then the third part is the meditation. See, this is where the monk has to come to a forest, go to a forest, because the forest is a quiet place, away from all the noise, distraction. If you live in the city and meditate, it will be very difficult because you hear so many noises and there's so many activities going on. And you will find it very hard to to meditate, to concentrate. See, when you meditate, you need an object, like a, a mental object, to focus on, to have something for the mind to hold on to. If you don't, your mind will keep on thinking about this and that, about this and that all the time. And if the mind keeps on thinking, it will never stop. It will, not come, it will never come to calm. So you need something we call this a meditation object or subject. Now you can use your breathing as your meditation subject. You just focus your attention at your breathing. Close your eyes and just watch your breathing. And make sure that you only think about your breathing and not think about other things. If you, can, if you persist in doing this, eventually all your thoughts will slowly disappear. And eventually it will get to a point where it will just stop thinking. Then you have achieved your your meditation goal, but this is only a, a, a very small goal, because you what you want to do is to maintain the ability not to think or to think. You want to be able to control your your thinking. First, you know. First, you have to learn to know how to stop it. Once you know how to stop it, then you you can then be able to manipulate your thinking. You can let it think, or you can stop it. If you think about something that makes you feel unhappy, you can stop it right away. Or you can then direct it to think, to to give you the right knowledge. Think about think about the truth that will free you from this delusion of I, me, my, and myself. And when you feel tired of thinking. Then you come back and rest in your in your calm. You meditate for calm again by concentrate on your breathing to stop your thinking. Then if you if you progress your your the period of the mind stop thinking will be longer and longer. 
and you can use that to recharge your mental energy so that when you withdraw from that that state of calm you will have the energy to teach your mind more and more until this knowledge becomes uh, what you call always there, ever present in your mind you need this kind of knowledge to be able to 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 eject the delusion because your delusion working all the time is working all the time at every moment you always think of yourself you always think of an I all the time so this knowledge of not not I, not myself will also have to be ever present in order to be able to eliminate this other wrong knowledge this is what this is a full time job for a monk he will spend all his day all his, all his free time doing this in all the postures sometimes he sit for a while after he sit for a long time he felt uh, painful then he get up and walk but his mind still doing the same thing his mind still continually teach, teach the mind about about the real truth the truth of of not of not I, not myself, until it becomes uh, part of your knowledge, part of your being. Then, then you no long, then you will no longer consider anything to be yourself or your possession. Then you can let go of everything that way. Uh, okay. You said yeah, you have to leave your family, you have to get rid of all your other things. Um, I was talking to you at the beginning, I don't know. Um, uh, how do you do that? Do you, do you believe that you're, that you're happier now, or that you, you're finding the truth, or is it more like a, you just have to believe that it will happen? If you practice, the, the result will be apparent in yourself. It's like eating. When you're full, you know that you're full. When you eat enough food, you know that you, you are happy. Happiness is something you can feel inside yourself. It's not a belief. It's an experience. Okay, but do you experience it yes. already? Or? Yes. Okay. In your lifetime, in this lifetime, you can experience the happiness of nirvana in this lifetime. Um, in the societies in, in Europe and Northern America, um, Buddhism is obviously not that widespread. Now, um, if a famous person um, publicly announces that he would follow um, the teachings of Buddha now, this is quite um, recognized within the societies. Now, there are a couple of uh, famous people who do so, like for instance the actor Richard Gere, and they use their popularity to promote the case of Buddhism in general mm -hmm. and the case of special causes, like for instance Tibet in particular. Mm -hmm. um, now, do you appreciate that, or do you think um, actually Buddhism shouldn't be like promoted, but people should find the truth on on their own? More or less? Well, I think people should should come toward Buddhism out of their sense of uh, knowing that it is something good for them rather than because some famous person believes or follow, follow it. It is like buying something. You want to buy, when you want buy something you have, you want to buy it because you know it is good for you. Not because uh, a movie star buy it, so you you buy it, and when you use it, you find it's not good for you. It's not important. It's not uh, to Buddhism. It's not important who follow it or not, because Buddhism doesn't gain anything from anybody. Buddhism only gives. Yeah. So and Buddhism isn't isn't afraid of losing or disappearing from this earth, because it will it will eventually because it, uh, it is also subjected to the law of change, to the law of impermanence. This teaching the Buddha, of the, this, this present Buddha predicts that his teaching will only last for about 5,000 years. And after that, no one will be able to understand his teaching anymore. But then there will be a new Buddha. 
who will come and renew this teaching again. So it doesn't matter who follows Buddhism or not follow, because Buddhism doesn't doesn't gain or lose anything. Buddhism is here just to help other people. See, the Buddha, after his enlightenment, he had, he had a choice of whether to teach or not to teach. When he first, when he first thought about think, thinking about teaching, he was very discouraged because he knew that it is something very difficult, very hard for people to understand, to be able to follow his teaching. And he was so discouraged that he almost decided not to teach. Had he not taught, then he would become what we call a, a silent Buddha. See, there are two kinds of Buddhas. A person who has a le- became a Buddha and then decided not to teach, then he is known as the silent Buddha. But a, a Buddha who, after becoming a Buddha, decided to help other people by teaching them, then he has become a unknown Buddha, like this one that we know. Had he decided not to teach, then he would, we wouldn't know that there, there was a Buddha happened in this in this in this world. But after he after he sat and think for a while, then he 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 realized that people are not the same. People are like uh, like students in a class. There are some bright students and there are some dull students. There are Aces students and there are Cs students. And the Buddha classified people according to their knowledge into four stages, four levels. He compared them to the four level of the of the lotuses. The lotus when they when it first started it grew from the ground at the bottom of the pond. Then after a time it will rise to the middle of the pond. Then after some more time it will rise to the to the surface. Before to the just under the surface of the water. And then eventually it will rise above the surface of the water. These are the four four level of lotuses. The the lotuses that have have risen above the water level will blossom as soon as it receives the, the ray of the sunlight during the next day. This is compared to a person who are very intelligent. These are like A students, in which you can say a few words and they will understand what you talk about. Why the next level of lotuses? These are the B students. This you have to talk a lot more. You have to illustrate example to to make them understand. Then the third level is the C C C student. This will take a lot more explanation, more teaching before they can understand the truth. Then the last one is the F student. This they will never pass. These are like the lotuses that will never go full grown because they will be food for the fish and the crabs. So after the Buddha have uh, distinguished the differences in the ability of people, so he then become dis- he become encouraged enough to to decide to to teach to other people. But when he first teaching when he first start teaching he only picked the A student to teach. He went to those people who has already developed morality, who has already developed meditation, who has some calm already. All he has to do is to tell them to get rid of the the eye. And as soon as as soon as they, they heard this they can become enlightened right away. So most of the first group of students that the Buddha taught, they all became enlightened very quickly. Some of them at the time of listening, they can understand the truth and and become enlightened right away. But after after all these people have been enlightened, then he goes to the, the next group, the B students. Then later on he goes to the C students. But he never goes to the F students. The F students are those people who doesn't believe in his teaching. So he doesn't teach them. Okay, did I answer your question? 
he's from Russia. He's been here for almost eight months now. He lives like a monk, but he hasn't yet take up the road, that's all. Because he has uh, language difficulty, he doesn't speak much English. And to be a monk, you have to learn some chanting, you have to learn some of the Buddhist teaching. And he finds it very difficult to, to do. So, but he likes to meditate, he likes to live alone. He lives simple like this. Okay. Any question? Um, you are saying that we should live in charity, but still we should not connect to this world. How can you do both? No, when you when you still connect to the world, you do the charity part. You do gradually, you see. You don't have... When you're still living in the society, if you have something extra left, you give it to other people. Mm-hmm. Don't keep it to yourself. But as soon as you, as, as you, as the more you give, you feel more healthy. And the more you develop, you feel like you want to leave the society, then you give everything away. Okay, so connecting to society is just uh, not being de- developed enough. Yes. When you first started, you still have to live in the society because you don't have enough strength to, to live right away. So you, you do it gradually. You try to uh, loosen your attachment to society. And then the more you develop, the more you gain calm, you, f- you, can, you'll be, you will be more de- independent of the society. Because you can find happiness within yourself. The reason why you, you or I have to live in the society is because you still need the society to fulfill your happiness. So, but as soon as you find the happiness that you can find within yourself, then you know that you, you no longer need the society. And you want more of this happiness that you can find within yourself. So that's when you decide to become a monk, to, to lead the society. So you can concentrate fully on this happiness, on the development of this, this happiness. But while you still live in society, you still have to to have responsibility with the society that you live in, with your parents, your friends, and everybody. But when I say that when you leave the society, it doesn't mean you you sever everything from the society. You don't cut off your relationship with your parents, your friends, or anything like that. But you just cut off your activities with them, that's all. You just want to be alone to develop this kind of happiness. But you occasionally might call them up, or see them, or they even they occasionally might come and visit you and see you and talk to you. The the love, the bondage, uh, you know, is still there. You know, the relationship is still there, but it's just the activities is not there anymore. No, when I said that there's no difference, I mean the mind has no difference. Whether it's a, a, a female or a male mind, it is the same. Okay. The mind of you and that my mind is the same. It has the same delusion, it has the same greed, hate and delusion. There's no difference. There's no distinguish whether it's a male or a female there. But in a society in which uh, there is still interaction between male and female, there's still a distinguish between male and female. And there is a, a what you call a separation of, for monks to be away from the opposite sex. Because if they're not careful, they could be drawn back to to their their old way of life. See? Because when 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 a person become a monk, that it doesn't mean that he has suddenly cut off or eliminate his sexual desire. So, and if he happens to be close to a, a female or to the opposite sex, he can be 
uh, he can be aroused. So to protect the monks from this, the in Buddhist tradition, the women are supposed to be away, not too close to the monks. Like when when woman giving something to the monk, the monk has to use a piece of cloth instead of receiving it with the hand, because sometimes there might be an accident, the hand might touch it, and it can arouse a feeling in 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 the monk. So just to to eliminate this this problem, the monk are asked to to receive things from a female with with a, with a piece of cloth. It's only to protect the monk's celibacy. That's all. Okay. So all questions are answered. So what what do you think you're gonna do with this knowledge? You might take it up, try it out. You think it's possible? You think it's the truth? Uh, Sure, we can try to be better, to behave more morally, but apart from that, we need to. Unless we try, we, we can you know what yeah. we can achieve. Well, it's a good start in a way. Too. This is like planting a seed of enlightenment in your mind. If you, if you take care of that seed. Mm by nourishing it with, you know, with nutrients, it might grow, it might make you to be something different from, than from what you are today. You might be wiser, kinder, nicer, more selfless, and more happy with yourself. If, if that happens, I think this, this trip here is profitable. It's not a waste of time. So if there's no more question, then I think we can then conclude this by paying the respect to our teacher, the Buddha, again. Okay.